us on our podcast this week. It's really great to have you. And um, yeah, and I guess probably a good place to start maybe or a good place to start just to tell us a little bit as much as you want to a little bit about yourself and your family and where you live or what you do or anything anything that you feel comfortable sharing yeah so thanks for having me Christina um, I'm well not so new mum now she's just turned a year old um, and so that's probably sort of been a bit of a milestone in some ways yeah. Um, I'm a health professional based down in Invercargill um, and so I do um, work for a private company um, mm. and I was working full time prior to having a baby and um, one of the parts of our journey was having to come back to work a little bit earlier than I planned um, and so there's probably lots and lots of things that we'll end up talking about today. Um, from yeah. our journey so yeah my first child's just turned um, a year old just over a week ago yeah well congratulations on getting through that first year thank you I feel like <laughs> it's, a, it's a milestone for your ba your baby but it's a big milestone for you too you know because that that first year is <laughs> it's a doozy right um, yes yeah <laughs> yeah so and and uh, your little one-year-old you have a you have a boy a girl I've um, got a wee girl. Wee girl. Lovely. So um, so tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, you know, was your pregnancy planned? Was she planned all along? Um, what was the story with that? Yeah, so um, we decided that we were ready to start a family and um, but, oh, okay, we'll just kind of see what happens and not necessarily trying, trying, but not not trying, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, and it happened quite quickly and we thought, oh, okay, right. <laughs> so um, we, were, we were quite fortunate in that respect. Um, yeah. Pregnancy was a little bit average. Um, I was quite nauseous throughout most of it and completely exhausted. Um, mm. Definitely not as bad as some other people um, experience pregnancy, but it wasn't something I'd, I'd jump forward to do over and over. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was working throughout and I finished up at 38 weeks. Um, my work is mostly office based. Um, mm. And so I thought, well, the longer I work up until um, birth, the longer I've got afterwards. Um, so my partner and I um, got together right at the um, first COVID lockdown um, and we'd, we'd just met and started dating and then lockdown happened and he was kind of between houses. Um, he was temporarily living with his uncle and about to move into a rental so he ended up just moving in with me. Um, and it's all worked out. We've purchased a house and everything together. And so mm -hmm. um, Luna, our baby, was actually due on our anniversary. And she came on due date, which is also St. Patrick's wow. Day. So <laughs> she, she managed to line everything up really well. Um, and yeah. it's, it's always that interesting thing. And I now understand it from speaking to other mums that you, it's just the waiting game when you finish work. Um, and you're like, could the baby come tomorrow? Could it be a week overdue? Um, but she came bang on. So I had about two wow. weeks of just settling in at home and, and trying to get things sorted. Yeah. Um, and then, well, we, we actually thought she was going to come the day before. Um, I ended up from my waters breaking to giving birth about 42 hours. Um, oh, so it was... What a lengthy process. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is a really, really long time. Um and um would you say that that labour, you know, from your point of view, was it was it what you wanted it to be, or was it what you were expecting it to be? Or yeah, what what were what were your feelings um, around that? I guess there's an element of you have no idea what to expect. Um, I would have liked it to have been a lot shorter um, 
we had complications around COVID and staffing at the hospital, um, like pretty much everywhere else in the country, Invercargill, um, our hospital is extremely short staffed. Um, mm. And we and COVID was sort of quite rampant around that time. Um, and so while my waters broke about 2.30 in the morning and I contacted the midwife about eight o'clock in the morning saying, look, nothing, nothing's happening. I'm not having contractions, but just FYI, things are obviously on the move. Um, and she said, oh, look, you know, if nothing's happened, I'll meet you at the hospital tonight um, because your waters have been broken that long. We're probably going to need to give some antibiotics and things. Mm. So we met her at the hospital that evening. Um, and unfortunately, she was in a caesarean with another mother at the time. So it was mm. about an hour that we were hanging around waiting for her. And so then they wanted to start um, some antibiotics and induction medication because my waters had been broken for about 18 hours. Um, yeah. But we were sent home to come back the next morning because there weren't enough staff to do that. Yeah. Um, so we had to come back at 6 a.m. Um, and as a wee side note, we're, we're on tank water, we're just out of town. And so I was having a shower before going into the hospital at we yell out to my partner because the water pressure starts going down oh, and so you know it's like 20 past five in the morning in the dark he's having to go outside and um try and connect a hose up to the tank water because oh, we've run out of water um you ran out of water on the day yes. that you're going oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah that is yeah. so bad so, so we were just oh. kind of laughing going okay got to roll with it and we show up to the hospital and at least have and the <laughs> I know, I know. I just quickly finished my shower and <laughs> got out. So he missed out. Um, but again, not enough staff at the hospital. So we didn't really see anybody till about eight o'clock. Um, and then they started all the medication and bits and pieces. And then um, by about, I think it was about 10.30, we went through to delivery. Um, and I just remember thinking, oh, yeah, OK, cool, it's not going to be that long. And I remember um, the the midwife coming and I ended up having to have some pethidine because the contractions were just getting so uncomfortable. Um, I couldn't actually walk to the toilet. I had to try and time it between contractions. And then um, I actually had to have my partner help me at some point because if I had a contraction on the way, I actually needed to grab onto something and so she sort of did a check and I remember her saying oh yeah you're about three centimetres dilated and I said this bad oh, 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 <laughs> because in my head I'm thinking how much longer this is going to be mm. and and I felt like the goalpost just kept being shifted and oh, um, I think there was one point it was I think around seven, uh, six o'clock and then I had started pushing and she goes, oh, yeah, look, you know, we'll have, we'll have a baby here at this point by 7 o'clock. So in my head, I've gone, great, okay, I've got enough energy till 7 o'clock. Baby's going to be here in an hour. Cool. Made a, made a mental plan for myself. Yeah. 7 o'clock rolls around and there's no sign of baby. Oh. And I'm going, how long is this going to be? And I'm absolutely shattered. And mm. um, they've got me hooked up to the monitor and I can see um, – my heart rate and, and my heart rate sort of keeps dropping down. The only reason it comes back up is because I have a contraction. Um, so baby's heart rate or your heart rate? My my heart rate. Your um, heart rate, okay. Yeah, but unfortunately she just had her head on a bit of an angle. And, oh. um, so they, they could see her, they could feel her, but she just wasn't progressing. Um, and so mm. it ended up needing to, we needed to have, um, a specialist come in and we actually had um, Mama Dr Jones which was pretty cool it was um, nice to meet her and yeah. it, it was sort of around that point that nobody was having the conversation but I was thinking mentally yep okay we've things could go either way here um, mm -hmm. and I really didn't want a caesarean um, if I could help it and so I was probably being a little bit stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> I was, yeah. I was, and um, I know my partner and my midwife were saying, you know, are you okay? I was like, yeah, just 
trying to keep going. And um, so eventually she was born just after 8.30 at night. Um, so it was about two, two and a half hours of pushing. Um, wow. And we ended just, up needing. Man, you must have been exhausted. Yeah, yeah. And I would have loved to have seen some photos prior to her being born because I know that I was barely conscious at some point but then you see the photos of me holding her afterwards and I look worn out but I I don't look as bad as, as I had felt <laughs> half an hour earlier yeah um, it's that it's yeah. a re that reward um after yeah yeah but man what a mountain you had to climb eh and yeah um did you actually sleep at any point during that time um when they gave me the pethidine, I managed to doze. I didn't completely yeah. sleep, um, but I remember them bringing lunch in and I just went, nah, I, I don't want any food. And I was just about sick, even just thinking about trying to eat. Yeah. Um, and then I just kept dozing for a couple of hours. So I could still, I still felt the contractions, but they were okay. They, um, yeah, yeah. like they were uncomfortable, but um I felt like I could actually move around with them. Yeah. Um, it's a really, it's like a real shock to the, you know, to start, it's like when you start being a parent, you're, you're exhausted from, as mm. you know, from the word go, because your, your body has gone through this massive thing. And, and mm. it's like, you know, you're kind of almost on the back foot immediately, aren't you? Um, yeah, in terms yeah. of sleep and energy and and stuff like that and um yeah and so for you like how did you feel in the you know like um in the first sort of week or weeks afterwards how how was it how was it for you um I was I was really tired and um I mean during the birth I felt like I wanted to be in a different position. I was, I was lying on my back, um, but I was actually just too exhausted to change position. And mm. my partner and midwife had said, look, we'll help you. But I, I didn't even have the energy to, ha I mean, they would have had to have physically moved me. Um, yeah. I was really sore. Yeah, I was, um, I ended up having an episiotomy as well. So even yeah. sitting was quite uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, when when they first put her on my breast, she was fine. Um, she managed to latch really well, and it was fine. It was comfortable. Um, but basically, uh, that night she's okay. But the next day, basically, as soon as I got her on the boob, she would just be like out oh, like a life. <laughs> And so we were constantly trying to have to wake her up and she had a yeah. really strong latch. Mm. So every time we woke her up, it was kind of like this <laughs> really strong chomp yeah. suction. And mm. and everybody that came into the room, um, we weren't allowed any family or visitors because of COVID. And we later found mm. out that there were actually COVID, uh, sorry, COVID positive cases on the ward. Um, oh, wow plus them being short staffed. So of course we were trying to not ring the bell um, unless we really needed somebody because we we knew that they were just that short staffed. Um, afterwards, when we found out that there were COVID positive patients, we, we realized, well, that makes sense about how long it took even with being short staffed because they would have had to gown up and ungown every time they went into those rooms. Yeah. Um, so the whole, I was admitted Thursday morning and we left Saturday afternoon. That whole time we didn't have one nurse the same, um, which made it really hard. And so every time somebody came in, they, they would say, oh, she might be latching right, it shouldn't be hurting. And then they'd watch her and, and they'd help her latch. And they'd go, no, she's, she's latching fine, she's just strong. And I was going, you think? <laughs> Through gritted <laughs> teeth. Um, yeah. And so I got to the point where I was in tears every time I knew she needed to feed um, mm. because I was just so sore. Um, and in less than two days, my nipples were raw. Um, so it was just excruciating. Um, we were we had to stay until for at least 24 hours because of 
the delivery. Um, our plan had been to go out to a maternity home um, and mm. spend a couple of days there before going home. Um, yeah. But by the time that we were cleared to go from the hospital, uh, it was kind of no point going. Um, yeah. And we were having so many troubles around feeding, um, partly between keeping her awake to try and feed and partly because of the pain that I was in. Um, that they, they were happy from a clearance from the delivery view that we were both OK to go home, but they could see obviously that the mental health of both myself and my partner was not great due to lack of sleep and the issues with feeding and we weren't even allowed to leave our room. Um, yeah. So neither of us could get space or stretch our legs. Um, we weren't even allowed to walk around the ward. We weren't allowed to walk off the ward because of all the COVID stuff. Um, there was no access to outside from our room, so we were stuck. Um, we couldn't Obviously have... family couldn't come yeah. in. Or, yeah. yeah. So it, it was literally just the two of us with this baby mm. who would start crying and then I'd be crying. Um, and, you know, my partner couldn't even take her for a walk for us all to have a bit of space. Um, mm. And so we were just kind of a bit of a mess by that point. And um, the, one of the ward midwives came in and she said, look, from a medical point of view, we're happy to discharge. But obviously, the, you know, you, we don't have things 100%. So what would be your concerns about going home? And I said, well, at the moment, I can't feed my baby. Um, yeah. So I feel like I can't go home until I know I can feed my baby. Yeah. Um, and our saving grace was that it just so happened that that day there was a um, midwifery student on the ward who happened to be a registered nurse and um, registered lactation consultant. <laughs> wow. Um, and she absolutely saved us. Um, we, you know, still wanted to breastfeed, but we're like, this obviously isn't working right now. And and I actually need an opportunity to heal to be able to keep feeding her. Um, so she helped us with a plan um, for mixed feeding, going home and... Um, yeah introducing formula and even that in itself it was a not really what we had planned not really what we had yeah. had chosen for our journey but at the same time we needed to be able to feed our baby and so it mm. was what it was um mm. so we ended up getting home and um we had both of our mums around um uh, our dad stayed away and we'd, we'd kind of said to the rest of the family, look, we just need a day or two to kind of settle in. We're absolutely exhausted. Um, unfortunately, my partner's um, extended family, we missed two funerals and a wedding um, due to wow. being in a hospital and having a baby. Um, wow. So there was a lot going on with that family. Mm. And in some ways, that was a... The blessing from keeping family away was actually um, that uh, because there were the family events happening um, and his sisters were there from out of town, two of them ended up getting COVID. Um, so they would have, they found out the day after we were home. Um, so we potentially would have had COVID in the house in the first week had, had we not sort of getting away for the oh. first day or two. Um, so it just it was feeling like one thing after another. Um, yeah, yeah. What, looking back rough. on that, you know, um, you know, and just you know, seeing your tears and and you know, watching the emotion on your face as you know you're talking about this, um, it's obviously still, um, you know, a hugely emotional story for you. Would would you? Would you describe it as traumatic? You know, do you, would you yeah, sort of I, describe I've, it that way? Um, I spent a lot of time with Gina, obviously through Mother's Health yeah. is talking about this. And um, I felt like had it had the birth just been like that, yeah, it was, it was average. It wasn't great. It wasn't what we planned. Mm. Um, 
and and looking and thinking about the fact that had this been 50 or 100 years ago potentially one or both of us might not be here um but that I think I was okay with um had it just been that but then just one thing after another yeah um I was explaining to junior and counselling I think that's what made it traumatic that it was kind of yeah. all of these things that mm. we had no control over and yeah. not not that we had set plans but didn't really go how we thought they might mm. um at, but at the same time you're also sort of downplaying it because you know that um other people have it worse and hey at least this didn't happen and at least you've got a healthy baby <laughs> you know yeah. and, and we, we certainly don't take that for granted um but I think it took a very long time for me to actually accept and not acknowledge that it was still okay for us to have these feelings about our journey yeah um, absolutely and I think I put off getting help for so long because it was with it being one thing after another, it felt like, okay, once this thing's sorted, we'll be okay. And we just need to get through this, mm. whatever it might be. And then the next one would happen. And you'd be, yeah. okay, that's cool. We got through the last thing. We'll just get through this thing. But then the next thing would happen. Yeah. Um. So in, in terms of a newborn, apart from the feeding, which was excruciating, um, Till probably like it was probably about eight weeks before I felt we got that kind of sorted. Um, yeah. But she was otherwise perfect newborn. Sleep, feed, change nappy, on repeat. Thank God um, for that. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, and, like thank you. Yeah. Like imagine if that had also been, you know. Oh, and it was and it was great you know? because it meant yeah. that I knew I knew that I had about three and a half hours um, between feeds. So yeah. I could shoot out um, into town and, and do something just to kind of have a bit of space um, until she was about three and a half weeks old and then she just started getting really miserable, screaming, and we're like, she's been fine, we don't know what's wrong, we haven't changed anything, and she ended up having a dairy intolerance. Mm -hmm. And so we tried all these other things, um, hoping that, me eliminating dairy would be the last option, but we got to that option um, at about mm. seven weeks. Um, and so then that was a whole nother new change that I was, you know, you're already so exhausted physically yeah. and mentally that then having to think about a dietary change and, okay, well, yeah. what am I going to eat instead and how are we going to adjust our cooking? And mm. um, the mental load was high. Yeah, it yeah, was yeah. It was tough. Yeah. yeah. And and my partner yeah. had gone back to work by that point. Um and so I was just at home with this baby that was basically asleep or or screaming. Not not just a newborn yeah. cry, like actually just inconsolable screaming at times. Yeah, yeah. Um and so again it, it just felt like another thing on the journey that um mm -hmm okay, we're, we're finally getting feeding sorted, but now feeding changes because my supply is dropping a little bit because I'm changing what I'm eating. And yeah, so we've <laughs> it's it's been, it, it was really, really tough for probably the first five months or so. Um, yeah. And, and also just to acknowledge, you know, that first eight weeks, because, you, you know, you were saying the first eight weeks were the hardest. Yeah. Um, it didn't it le it and it does ease a little bit, but not e not you know, it eases gradually, but that first eight weeks, and I don't know I don't I just reflecting on how I felt, it felt like it, it the days were extremely long and the nights were really long yeah. and it felt like you're in this endless three hourly <laughs> routine of <laughs> just and it, and it almost, it's just, I found it awful. Like, honestly, yeah. I found it awful. Um, yeah, and that's not what you expect going into it, eh? You don't no, expect it no. to be like that at all. Um, and, and people say it's going to be hard, but yeah. I don't think you 
ever expect, how hard or for how long. Yes. Um, and I think for me, a big part of that was around the, the breastfeeding journey. Um, yeah. There's little to no education about that beforehand. And yeah. so while I didn't expect that it was necessarily going to be easy straight off, in my head, I'd kind of go, well, you know, it's natural when people have done it forever and, you know, you just put the baby on the boob and away you go. Um, yeah. Because nobody really gives you any education that's different mm. to that. Um, and again, health system, limited resources, um, <laughs> didn't really, couldn't really get into the lactation consultant, uh, was really lucky that... Um, one of my friends is the peer support coordinator for the breastfeeding peer support coordinator locally. Mm -hmm. um, but between sickness in both our houses and bits and pieces, we yeah. um, we couldn't meet face to face. But she was providing me some some message support. Um, the I had a midwife who was also a lactation consultant, but um, she's just like, oh look, you know, you're doing so well. I wish I wish other mums who had stuck at it as long as you and, and been really trying. And I was like, that's cool, but it still hurts, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. It's still not ideal. Um, and so I think, again, a big part of this journey and the trauma of the experience was not being able to get the help that I felt that I needed um, yeah. at the time or to the level that we needed. Yeah. Um, and partly partly south and partly the health system in general um but just you're feeling like everything's out of your control already and then you can't actually access things that would help you um and you just feel a bit helpless yeah yeah yeah, yeah because i mean you're basically on this journey for the first time ever you've got no idea how to how to do this you need people to help you to to figure it out and I think yeah. feeding is the biggest one because it, it it isn't it isn't necessarily like some people they just feed and it just seems to work um mm. and there's not really a problem I wasn't one of those people either <laughs> and not to take away from from your story but I, I relate so much to what you're what you're talking about because um and I, of course, I gave birth at a time that wasn't, there wasn't COVID, there wasn't short, short staffed. I was in Auckland, it was a pretty busy hospital, um, but, you know, there, there wasn't, as far as I was aware, they, they weren't short of staff. Um, and there was no COVID on the ward or anything like that, you know, nothing of like that going on. Um, but what I found when, um, when I was trying to breastfeed, because by the time I gave birth, I was basically not interested. Like I was exhausted. I was I was like mm. you and, and that I was exhausted. But it was post C section and I was done. I was just mm. I was just done. Um and so I, I thought, oh yeah, well, you know, we'll figure it out later, you know, and let, let me go yeah. to sleep, you know. Um and it never re it he never really latched properly. And so his glucose dropped and so we had to do mm. um, mixed feeding. But I would constantly have these uh, midwives coming in. And I don't know if you, if this is just a me thing or if other people relate to that, if you relate to it. But I felt like these midwives, and it would often be a different midwife every shift or, or at least every day, and they would all have a different view on what was going wrong you know yeah. and and they would grab your boob like this is the grab your boob and shove the baby on and it felt like your boobs are no longer your boobs anymore you know yeah. they just belong to if anybody coming in can just has the right to grab them and and push this baby onto your boob and that felt really invasive to me um but I didn't feel like it was my body anymore so, you know, I didn't object to that, you know, and I didn't know. But there was a point at which I was so, you know, upset, like you were upset. And I, it was probably around that time of the baby blues kicking in, you know, mm. when that, that sort mm. of that three-day thing. Um, and I just said, 
I, I told someone, I don't know, I don't even know where I got the courage from, but it must have been the baby blues angry or something. But I was like, I'm, there is not to be one midwife to come into my room. And I shut the door in for the whole day. No one came in because um, I just had enough of them, you know, just kind of giving me this different advice and this, you know, um, and like you, I finally, on I think it was day five, I think it was, um, I discharged myself um, against medical advice in the end because I just couldn't cope with it anymore. But that's usually what I do with hospital anyway. Um, <laughs> not the greatest patient. Um, but yeah, and uh, I had a lactation consultant come in on that fifth day and tell me, oh, he's got a tongue tie and that's why mm. he can't feed. And it's like, you know, that whole time, and I don't know if this is how you felt, and, the whole time I was feeling like a failure because I'm meant to be able to breastfeed this baby. That's my job, and I'm not doing it. I'm not. I'm not succeeding at this. Um, and um, so I felt really, you know, bad about that. And for me to have, oh, he had a tongue tie this whole time. It. I felt really in some ways a relief in some ways not because of course I don't want my son to have that but also huge distress that I had been made to feel like I was doing something wrong there was something mm -hmm. I was doing not you know that wasn't correct and yeah. and all along it wasn't to anything to do with that yeah, yeah. It's, absolutely and that and and like I said every time somebody came in they'd be like oh she won't be latching properly and you kind of get manhandled and and most yeah. most of them were really good at saying oh do you mind if i get in there and, <laughs> and help you well, at least they're asking you yeah yeah mo most of them did and and you kind of like go ahead because i don't know what i'm doing it's not like i thought it was going to be um and then they'd realize that she was latching fine and so then they kind of go oh no she's she's latching fine and see you later type thing and you're going mm. i thought it wasn't meant to hurt <laughs> you yeah. lied everybody lied yeah. Um, and then, I mean, in, in theory, it's still not, but I think, I think there needs to be a change in the way people say that, that it's still something new for your body to get used to. Yeah. And, and I remember, um, one of somebody, I don't even remember who now saying, oh yeah, you've got really fair skin. So your nipples are likely to be more sensitive. And yeah. I was like. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Also, what can I do to make this not hurt anymore? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think, and just being surprised and and how quickly the damage was done, but there was not really any support around that about how to yeah. fix it. So that then led into the um, the uh, trauma. It was trauma every every time I knew she needed feed, yeah. and yeah. I I would be tensing up because I was dreading. Yeah. I I knew what needed to happen next, and I knew I needed to feed her. Um, and nobody had really offered any other options, and mm. and I'm a bit stubborn, <laughs> so I I probably you know I did want to try breastfeeding, but it also got to the point where I was like I I cannot keep doing this. Yeah. Um, and. Like I was getting, I was getting pain just from knowing she needed to be fed, and that was without. Yeah, that's a psych like a psychological near. association. Yeah. Yeah. I like you. I kind of persevered, and and on the one hand, because it ended up being okay in the end after a long time, a really long time. On the one hand, I'm sort of really grateful for that, you know, like I'm really because he ended up being my only baby. Um. And on the other hand, I can specifically see that my mental health, the state of my mental health, which was already not great. I'd had it had antenatal anxiety, um, but but my depression went hugely bad. You know, uh, it was I just fell into really, really moderate, I would say moderate to severe depression because of the feeding and because it was so long of it not working well so many weeks and weeks and weeks and for me finally I got to the Plunkett Family Centre 
And it, all it is, I honestly think this, is that people come up with all these ideas for solutions and one works. And yeah. it's like all the others didn't work, but finally something works. And honestly, I don't even think that there's rhyme or, you know, they, they yes, I think lactation consultants obviously have more of an understanding and more likely to get that right. But, but honestly, I had so many experts um, kind of advising me and nothing it's almost like let's try this let's try this let's try this like so you know and finally I tried nipple shields and also the Plunkett family uh, the, ner the nurse she was also a lactation consultant she taught me like you would teach you know she said to me when you because I was like you when when my baby was crying because he was hungry and I couldn't feed him I was crying too you know, and it was just horrible. And, and of course, I was really tense, you know, holding my little baby um, at feeding time. And so she, she taught me that even though you're feeling extremely stressed, you have to relax your body. So yeah. because your, your milk won't come down um, if you're really, really tense. And so, um, and so, I had to trick my body that I was, you know, that I, that I was not actually completely beside myself and, yeah. you know, relax my arms and relax my body and try and, and relax, even though this baby is screaming. Um, and, yeah, and it was through the nipple shields and basically waiting for his mouth to get big enough because mm -hmm. um, once his mouth was big enough, I could take the nipple shields away and then I was fine. But mm -hmm. it was just, yeah, but in hindsight, I know that my depression would never have been as bad as it was if I had stopped breastfeeding. But at the same time, I also would have grieved it so much. Yes. And and I, I mean, I so there, it's almost like there's no um, there's no good answer for that. And it depends mm. on how attached you are to breastfeeding. But it's super hard when you're getting those messages around breast is uh, breast is best, and and you're getting that pushy, pushy messages, um, which I think is changing now. But it, yeah. be, particularly back in my day, because I'm so old, um, <laughs> um, you know, they really pushed breast is best um, in those days. That it was really, really hard not to feel guilty about that. What do you? you know, you looking like, I don't know what your story is in terms of breastfeeding and, because you were mixed feeding, um, did you, en did it end up, what, where did it end up for you? Um, we, we did manage to get exclusive breastfeeding, um, but that was right around the same time that we're like, okay, we have to cut dairy. Um, so that was maybe about seven weeks. And then I think she was about 13 weeks that were like, she's not gaining weight. She's not. Oh, so that, that was another factor into everything that there was yeah. that stress that like you, I, I felt like I was failing because I was having trouble with breastfeeding. But then I felt like I was failing because she wasn't gaining enough weight. And mm. and I just, no matter what I tried, it, it was like I didn't have enough supply and I, I still wanted to keep trying breastfeeding. Um, and so about, I think it was about 13 weeks, we had to go back to mixed feeding. Um, we knew she couldn't have a dairy formula. So we mm. went and bought sheep's milk or goat's milk formula. Goat's milk probably, not, yeah. Yeah, not realising that they have the similar proteins to cow's milk. And so yeah. that kicked that whole thing off again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then, so we were we were mixed feeding, and I was just going, okay, it is what it is. Um, at least you know whatever I can give her. You know, we've managed to get to this point. Let's see if we can go till six months. Um, managed to get to six months mixed feeding, um, and then I started back at work. So I mean, it got to the point around that time that I was only really doing probably morning and night feeds anyway. Yeah. Um. And and one when I got home from work about two thirty three o'clock, so kind of three feeds a day when I started back at work, and I was like, okay, that's manageable. In some ways, that the, the blessing from that is that um we're not having to worry about 
having enough milk for her when I'm at work because we've got formula. So we've kind of got the best of both worlds. Um, and then it kind of just kept dropping and dropping. And I think I think finally pulled the pin about um, eight months because mm. I was I ended up only doing I was expressing at my bedtime for her bedtime feed the next day. And if she was awake by the time I left in the morning, I'd do a morning feed. Um, but my partner and I had a conversation and, I, and he was he's more than supportive whatever way I went. Um, but it got to the point where I'm like, well, I'm, I'm only feeding her once. Yes, I'm expressing at the time, but like the amount of work it takes and time. Yeah the amount of milk we get and it got to yeah. the point that she's still needing topped up anyway that I was like okay let's just scrap that feed um and so it just it didn't didn't quite go to plan but she's been fine um and yeah the, the bonus <laughs> the bonus about um being dairy free was that we then managed to get prescription formula um because that was another thought going through my head going formula is at least 20 bucks a tin um more depending yeah. on what brand you go for and that's yeah. going to be another cost um yeah. that we hadn't sort of accounted for and of course during the the late part of my pregnancy and and after Lona was born the cost of lowing was just skyrocketing so all these things mm -hmm. we've budgeted on had significantly increased which was another sort of stress yeah. um and so yeah about eight months we we kind of just the pin on that and the mixed feelings about it I was I was really pleased to have got to that point and at mm. least mixed feeding um there was definitely some grief there because it hadn't hadn't been what I expected um mm. I had kind of just thought oh yeah you know breastfeed to a year you know cool so that hadn't gone to plan um and it obviously been quite a traumatic journey yeah um but and then there was some guilt about feeling a sense of relief mm. um, that, that I didn't have to do that anymore. Um, mm. And I, I was happy about it, but I was also so many emotions and and that um, that guilt about, you know, I worked so hard to get here and I've tried to feed my baby and, yeah, just... I don't think anybody prepares you for the, the amount of emotions you go through in yeah. the first six months. And and you realistically know that hormones are playing a part and, you know, that you can't necessarily help any of it. It doesn't make it any easier.